We'll get started in just one moment. On behalf of the American Heart Association, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar about the recent target aortic stenosis publication and learnings from a new site. I'm Kaylee Sadoff, Program Consultant for Target Aortic Stenosis at the American Heart Association. Edwards Life Sciences is a national sponsor of the American Heart Association's Target Aortic Stenosis. I'd like to begin by going over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. If you'd like a copy of today's presentation, you can download a PDF from the handout section. If you experience technical difficulties, most users can be resolved, issues can be resolved by refreshing your browser, changing browsers, or making sure to follow pop-ups. If that does not work, please review the system requirements or contact the GoToWebinar customer service team using the system requirements link found in your confirmation and reminder emails. At the conclusion of today's presentation, you'll really receive a link to access today's recording and an invitation to complete our feedback survey. We welcome you to submit text questions for our presenters at any time in the questions pane of the control panel. We'll collect your questions and address them at the end of the presentations as we have time. It's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter today, Dr. Brian Lindman. Dr. Lindman is the Medical Director of the Structural Heart and Valve Center and an Associate Professor of Medicine at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville and spends most of his time on clinical translational research centered on aortic stenosis. He's a member of the Science Advisory Group of the American Heart Association Target Aortic Stenosis Initiative and Vanderbilt is one of the 15 pilot sites who continues to participate in the initiative. Dr. Lindman, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Kaylee. Um, can you hear me okay? We can. All right, you can see my screen? We can. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> all right, well, it's been, um, it's my pleasure uh, to participate in this uh, important initiative. Uh, I've been uh, playing a role since phase one, as Kaylee alluded to. Um, and it's been great to partner with AHA and uh, Edwards uh, in the execution of this important initiative. <clears throat> so recently, uh, we had a publication come out uh, in Circulation uh, Quality and Outcomes, uh, summarizing and, and um, um, giving uh, an overview of what transpired during phase one of this uh, initiative and uh, pointed to some of the uh, changes and, and opportunities and growth that are anticipated for uh, phase two. And so uh, here's, here's the publication and encourage you to download it uh, and access it for, for more detailed information, but I'll give an overview uh, during this uh, time. Um, You're not seeing on the right side of my screen this panel, are you? Nope, we just see the slide. All right, so the goal uh, of this initiative is to identify, measure, and report on the processes that occur from the initial echocardiographic diagnosis of AS with the long-term goal of improving patient outcomes. And so the rationale for this is that to date, uh, assessment of quality AS care has focused only on the procedure and afterward. Many on this call, I'm sure, are familiar with the TVT and STS uh, registries and databases, and these, of course, are focused on the t uh, from the time of transcatheter valve replacement uh, or surgery, uh, dealing with um, <clears throat> the procedure, periprocedural complications, and afterward. Uh, but there's been no um, no assessment of, no awareness of what happens upstream of that procedure. And increasingly, there are data that are coming out uh, in several publications showing that uh, there's a significant under-treatment problem, 50% or even more, 
of patients with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis are not getting treated. With valve replacement, and this has serious consequences, both in terms of mortality and rehospitalization uh, and, and quality of life. <clears throat> So quality assessment uh, should really start upstream of valve replacement in order to ensure that patients who warrant and desire valve replacement are getting treated in a timely manner. Um, and so uh, when, when we only focus on uh, procedure and post-procedural quality, we are not able to quantify care gaps uh, in patients who are not appropriately diagnosed and treated which is especially important when addressing disparities of, in care, which um, have also been documented in patients with aortic stenosis. And so um, with no existing mechanism, as we went into phase one, uh, no existing mechanism in place to measure quality of care during uh, this period, there were several challenges uh, that were encountered. Uh, programs needed uh, to identify, or, or the scientific advisory group needed to identify uh, metrics and uh, over time, those needed to be uh, uh, refined and clarified uh, and prioritized uh, with feedback from participating sites. Often when patients were referred to tertiary centers for treatment, um, the, the information, both echocardiographic reports and other clinical information, um, was oftentimes difficult to obtain uh, to fill out case report forms um, when they were referred from, from the community. Uh, sites were not uh, used to identifying and tracking patients uh, along the patient journey from detection or diagnosis by echo uh, all the way through uh, treatment. And so this required new ways to uh, identify uh, and track uh, those patients. <laughs> so uh, what transpired was uh, the AHA formed a scientific advisory group. Uh, to provide uh, oversight and direction and input on, on how to um, begin to implement uh, this desire to assess quality upstream of the procedure. 15 hospitals were identified from, from a variety of uh, geographies, uh, including uh, different size hospitals, uh, some teaching, some not, uh, and other variations and characteristics. Sites were asked to query their ECHO databases uh, to identify patients with moderate or severe aortic stenosis and then sample a portion of those patients for entry into the uh, online registry database. 68 data elements were abstracted uh, and those covered demographics, medical history, symptom status, uh, echo measurements, other imaging uh, uh, assessments, stress tests, uh, treatment choice, rationale for it, and uh, relevant dates of all these things. Uh, multiple encounters uh, were entered for each patient in many, in many cases um, a, a, as they were tracked uh, over time and as new data uh, became available. <clears throat> we had an opportunity for, and this was an important part of the learning, to have quarterly um, uh, learning collaborative meetings that, that included all 15 sites, including physicians and uh, others who were abstracting data and, and others who were part of the team uh, to learn uh, some of the, the challenges uh, that were encountered, um, to troubleshoot those, to come up with ideas for sites who were experiencing uh, success or traction in certain areas. They could provide uh, some ideas uh, for sites who were, were having problems and, and uh, begin to develop best practices for some of the things that we were trying to do. During phase one, which is a three-year period, uh, the registry included uh, almost 7,000 encounters that were um, uh, entered into the registry, representing 2,500 patients. So many patients had multiple encounters over time. You can see 42% women, 15% non-white or Hispanic. <clears throat> And there were 1,286 who were identified with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. And of those, you can see that 46% were, were treated with TAVR, 17% uh, SAVR, and 36% uh, did not uh, receive treatment. 63% uh, percent of, of those with severe aortic stenosis received valve replacement. And for 52%, uh, that was within 90 days of the diagnosis. Um, AS-related symptoms were most uh, common 
of course, in patients with severe aortic stenosis, but also often observed uh, in patients with moderate aortic stenosis, uh, which, was, which was really quite interesting to actually note and is relevant to some ongoing trials in that space. 92% uh, of the ECHO reports had somewhere in the report uh, all of the measures uh, that you see listed here. <clears throat> so in terms of some of the outcomes from phase one, uh, symptomatic severe aortic stenosis with a multidisciplinary team visit before or up to 60 days after diagnosis, almost 70%, uh, that was true. Symptomatic severe AS seen by the multidisciplinary team who were treated with TAVI or SAVR within, nine, within 30 days, uh, that number was around 35%. And then those who were symptomatic with severe AS who were treated with valve replacement within 90 days of the diagnosis, again, that was roughly half. In terms of echo completeness, notice the scale here starts at 90%. So this was actually quite, quite good on most of these metrics. Uh, somewhere in the echo report, if, if, if the person had moderate or severe AS, Somewhere in the echo report, 94% had valvary included. And then here you can see the other percentages in the mid to high 90s for, for uh, most of these uh, metrics. In terms of timely follow-up of echocardiogram, um, we looked to see of those with moderate AS, how many had a follow-up echo within 12 to 24 months. And of those with severe, how many had a follow-up echo within six to 12 months. The big caveat here is that uh, for our analysis and the way that this ended up playing out, uh, we only analyzed people who actually had two echocardiograms in the database. So I think the actual number who had timely follow-up is actually somewhat lower, um, but uh, because we didn't from the get-go tell sites to enter every echo that was done, um, we're unable uh, to assess that. So th this is uh, um, erring on this, the high side for sure. Uh, so now as we move um, from this pilot initiative to a national program, as we move into phase two, um, we're, we're nearing um, uh, the latter part of year one of phase two, and uh, Edwards has provided additional support for us to really grow and ramp up this program. So <clears throat> as we've looked to translate to other settings, um, we, we had uh, lots of learning from phase one that's been critically important to refining uh, case report forms and metrics and the like uh, to uh, advance us to the next stage. We had diverse representation of hospitals, which was, was helpful in terms of our th uh, thinking about how to translate this to a, a variety of settings. Uh, this, the case report form has been streamlined and modified uh, to, to, to really try to focus in on the most salient information and to make sure that we have all the information that's required to map to the metrics uh, that we're emphasizing uh, in, in phase two. And uh, in phase two, there's also uh, interest in and, and an effort to try to better understand how we might automate as much of this as possible, recognizing that we want to minimize the burden on sites for uh, actual you know, FTEs who are manually abstracting this and trying to uh, look for ways that we might automate uh, where possible in reliable ways. So as we move uh, into the future um, and, and the phase two of this initiative, we're, we're considering uh, how to best measure quality uh, during, the, during this upstream uh, phase of management of aortic stenosis, upstream of the procedure thinking about not only how we document how patients in our system actually are managed uh, and referred and treated, but thinking about, well, where we're falling short, how do we improve quality? How do we do it in a sustainable way? How do we do it in a scalable way? How do we do it in a way that doesn't require someone micromanaging every little thing, um, but, but in ways that, that could be um, um, uh, implemented in a, in a hospital system in a systems-based manner. And then, of course, addressing disparities in care and trying to be mindful of how we create a quality initiative, how we implement best practices, 
in ways that could really raise all boats and, and, and mitigate some of the disparities in care that are related to age, sex, race and ethnicity, uh, rurality and, and uh, socioeconomic status and other uh, characteristics such as that. In terms of measuring quality, um, this is this is still in evolution, but but at this point, um, as we've moved into phase two, um, the primary metric that we're focusing on, somewhat akin to a door to balloon time for ischemic heart disease, is the percent of patients with a class one indication for valve replacement who receive valve replacement within 90 days of that class one indication. So we're really trying to to lean into the fact that those who warrant treatment are getting treatment and it's being done in a timely manner. Other metrics are those seen here uh, below, trying to recognize that we need to be able to accurately diagnose people uh, as to whether they have a class one indication and making sure that, that the, the parameters that are important for that assessment, um, such as stroke volume index or ejection fraction or a valve calcium score or a debutamine or assessment of symptoms, in many cases, we need to know those things to determine whether someone has a class one indication, and so we want to see that. Um, and then really uh, consistent with the class one indication and the guidelines, want to be seeing and measuring uh, that those who get treated with valve replacement are being uh, evaluated by the multidisciplinary team as, as strongly recommended and appropriate in 2023. And then uh, trying to ensure uh, that key information is included in ECHO reports, also trying to focus on the summary of the report and making sure that some of the key information is there, and, and trying to think through how can we offer clinical recommendations, walking the balance between, you know, not, not wanting to handcuff someone that, you know, valve replacement was recommended when this is just an imaging report, but at the same time, to lead the recipient of this report who may not exactly know what to do with the information as to what might be potential next steps consistent with guidelines, much like uh, in a radiology report, if there's a pulmonary nodule, you get a recommendation as to when follow-up imaging should be done or a mass on some organ in the abdomen, you, you get guidance. So trying to think through what that might look like in the echo. Uh, and then ensuring follow-up uh, is done in a timely manner for those who don't get warrant valve replacement. So in terms of improving quality, um, uh, this, this pilot initiative was initially focused on how to measure quality and refine data elements, um, but, but as I alluded to a moment ago, we're trying to really figure out what systems changes could be implemented to improve quality and to develop best practices for that that could be disseminated broadly, not only to sites that are included in this initiative, uh, but even beyond the scope of that. And then also, as I alluded to, as, as we implement these quality uh, measures, um, uh, recognizing and wanting to be mindful of how uh, we could do this in a way that mitigates some of the disparities in care that have been documented uh, in a number of publications. So um, at this point, um, I'll, I'll uh, stop and, and be happy to take uh, any questions from those who um, are on the webinar today. And if not, I think Kaylee may have some teed up for me. Thank you, Dr. Lindman, for that insightful presentation. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience at this time, but I do have a couple. So. Can you please explain how the initiative translates um, its value to a variety of hospitals and settings? Yeah, um, I, I think there are, um, I think it can be helpful to participate in initiatives, quality initiatives like this, because sometimes, you know, when we're, when we're clinicians at, a, at an organization, we may wish that certain things were implemented or available or prioritized because we we know it's the right thing to do for the clinical care of patients but sometimes you know with everyone um, uh, trying to scramble for their own priority it, it, it doesn't happen and so I, I think having an initiative like this can 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 help um, hospitals you know lobby for the ability to do echo queries you know I, you know queries of their ECHO database to be able to identify patients who may uh, need further evaluation for aortic stenosis. Another thing might be that's come up 
um, a lot of times is that many times in an echo report, there's discordance between the valve area and the gradients. And what is needed is a valve calcium score. Increasingly, this is, this is becoming much more common to recognize the need for valve calcium to clarify whether or not it is severe, warranting valve replacement or moderate and could be followed. And, and, and this is an area where I think probably a lot of centers, this is not norm, normal practice that, that they would you know, take a discordant echo measurement and say, okay, let's clarify with valve calcium. So they may not have a pathway, a clean and clear pathway for getting those tests ordered, a clear you know, order code for it. Um, and so that's a way by which you know, we're gonna be looking for that information. And if sites don't have that path, that'll be missing data. And, and, and so we want to encourage sites to have a path for that. And so, so the, be, participating in an initiative like this could help a site go to you know, the powers that be and say, look, we need to work out this pathway uh, so that we can really be uh, optimally managing and, and treating patients with aortic stenosis. So those are a few examples. And then the other one would be just if there are constraints in terms of scheduling, um, you know, and getting people into the OR or into the cath lab for a procedure in a timely way, um, this can also provide some opportunity to say, uh, for, for a site to say to their administration, look, best practice is that we need to be treating these people within, you know, this narrow frame of, of time. And uh, we're not able to do that for this, that, or the, the other reason. Um, what can we do to improve our, our throughput time so that patients get treated in a timely way? Right, that's a really great answer. Um, are you able to expand upon what options are available to automate the process more and how AHA might be working to validate these tools at this time? Yeah, um, I don't pretend to know all of them. There are a number of tools and vendors out there to help with this and, and, and those listening could reach out to the AHA to, to ask for a list of some of these um, I, I know that we're working uh, to test out Empiric, which was recently bought by Tempest at Vanderbilt to see how we can uh, automate a lot of this process. I know that Ignite um, is also another similar uh, tool that could be utilized in this manner, and, and, and there are others out there. Uh, but I, I really think this is an important part of phase two, is to figure out how we can automate as much of this as possible and abstract from the EMR in an automatic way uh, to minimize a burden on, on sites and manual abstraction, which, which is difficult uh, because hospitals are constrained and, and it's difficult to uh, you know, have FTE available to, to do this. And so we really need to figure this out. Right. I think we have time for one more and maybe this rolls into it. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing this initiative? Yeah, um, I mean, it, I, I think in some respects, it's kind of the last thing that, that, that hospitals uh, are bombarded by and, and centers by the need for lots of things <laughs> and, and including there's lots of registries, um, there's lots of demands for that. Um, and, and it can be overwhelming, I think, for sites to figure out, you know, just how to accomplish all that. Um, so I, I think in many respects, um, you know, that's one of the largest challenges is to figure out how to, to, to do this, to execute this in a way that minimizes uh, the burden for sites. Um, and, and then I think along with that, it'll be the fact that, you know, some of the things that these quality metrics are going to be encouraging sites to do in order to perform well may not be how they normally operate right now. And I alluded to the valve calcium score. I think that's a good example. Um, but there may be ways in which these patients are falling through the cracks and not getting the next testing. And so this is going to be, you know, pushing uh, all of us to, to ensure that those, that testing is done in a timely uh, and efficient way. So I, I think that'll also be an opportunity, but it also has challenges as you fight against some of the barriers to implementing uh, some of that testing and, and according to some of the timelines. Agreed. Thank you so much for your time today and um, sharing your insights on the overview of that publication. Um, really appreciate uh, your feedback and answering questions.
Thanks, and Kayla. at this time, I think we're going to go ahead and introduce our next presenters. Thank you, Dr. Lindman. Thank you. Um, for the next portion of our webinar, we're going to talk through um, some learnings from a newer site. And so we have Dr. Edward Bergen, who is a fellowship trained and board certified interventional cardiologist at Lake Charles Memorial Hospital in Lake Charles, Louisiana, where he is the medical staff president, board of trustees member, cath lab medical director, and TAVR program co-medical director. Prior to moving to Lake Charles, he served 14 years in the US Army as a physician, achieving the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and serving in Operation New Dawn in Baghdad, Iraq. He received his medical degree from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey School of Osteopathic Medicine and completed an interventional cardiology fellowship at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas. And along with Dr. Bergen is Ms. Steve the riot. She's a registered nurse and the valve clinic coordinator for the TAVR program at Lake Charles Memorial Hospital in Lake Charles, Louisiana. She's been in her current role since the facility's TAVR program began in 2018 and led the certification efforts to become the first program to receive the American College of Cardiology's transcatheter valve certification in 2019. She's the TBT registry site manager responsible for data entry and abstraction and also coordinates the TAVR patient care through the care continuum. And at this time, I'll turn it over to you both. Great, thank you so much. All right, you want to kick it off? Well, first of all, thank you for having us. Uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity. Um, obviously, a, a very noble initiative that uh, we're happy to be a part of. Uh, but what we've been tasked with today is just to give a brief overview of uh, our facility our, and our program, why we decided to uh, join the initiative, uh, how others can get started, and, and uh, what we've discovered in our relatively short time uh, with this initiative, just over a couple months. So who are we and where are we? Um, we're in Southwest Louisiana, uh, basically dead center between Houston and New Orleans. If you all watch the, uh, the news, you've certainly heard of us. A couple years ago, we had two natural disasters back to back, Hurricane Laura and Delta. Uh, that hurt us somewhat, obviously, our, our healthcare facility and, and uh, our program and uh, the population. Some some folks left and, and never came back. But, um, you know, we're a smaller community, about 80,000. Obviously, there's a lot of um, surrounding uh, communities that we also have satellites uh, that we can uh, obtain more, more patients from. But uh, our hospital is the uh, the largest uh, non-for-profit in southwest louisiana over 300 beds uh, we currently have uh, seven cardiologists there's one surgeon uh, we collaborate really really well together again we have three uh, satellite uh, community clinics that we go to um, to obtain obviously more more patients but uh, we average about 8500 echoes a year just to give you an idea of our volume and uh, our program started just over five years ago. Myself, my, Dr. Thompson, another interventional cardiologist, and Dr. Greg Lugo, a cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, Greg really uh, had a lot of experience coming in. He came from St. Louis, had already started uh, two prior programs. Uh, Chris and I had to go literally travel the world to get the requisite training, but uh, we did it and we started in 2018. And, and we've slowly built, you know, we're currently averaging about 50 tavers a year. Uh, Greg will still do, um, you know, we laughed about that, what it would do to his volume, but he's, he's still doing a fair amount of savers um, every year. Uh, as you already alluded to, uh, we're very proud to be the, the first program that was achieved the ACC's uh, certification. This was uh, mostly on the broad shoulders of my uh, valve clinic coordinator here, Misty, who's been phenomenal. And um, again, we, we joined the initiative just this past summer. And, um, you know, so why? I, I guess the, the bigger question would be why not, right? Um, at least for us, uh, we view it as uh, an internal audit uh, to see what we're doing well, uh, what we're not doing uh, as well as we can be. And of course, you know, looking at ways to improve. Um, you know, getting back to what you were just discussing, you know, I think the most important part is when folks are identified, getting them 
to a cardiologist ASAP is of paramount importance more than anything. Um, you know, to, to help educate, you know, we forget about the examination, examining the patient to, uh, um, you know, these, these patients that were, you know, we get a valve area less than one and a gradient of 20, what do we do with? Well, oftentimes our exam will answer that question. Um, but that's why we joined, um, you know, um, Misty's, you know, obviously doing the, uh, the brunt of the work, but from what I understand, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a huge um, monumental task and you, we can derive a lot of important data from it uh, to improve. Um, yeah, so I think Misty's gonna share a little more with y'all. Thank you. All right, so we were able to get started fairly quickly with this initiative, and I think a large reason is due to the fact that our TAPR physicians, such as Dr. Bergen, along with the sonographers, our heart team, and upper administration have been heavily involved in our program from the very beginning, providing a lot of support and buy-in throughout. This all really started mid-summer when I watched a webinar hosted by the AHA in which they discussed phase two and this initiative along with other sites sharing how they were able to create their sampling plan. I was really intrigued by it and really felt that we would find ways that we can improve upon, such as Dr. Bergen alluded. Initially, I had conversations with our TAVR physicians, then extended that to upper administration, and all were immediately on board and supportive. So in those early conversations, we did discuss role assignment, and I really did volunteer to spearhead this as I do the TABA, the uh, excuse me, TBT registry data entry as well. So once I looked at this data collection tool, I felt like it would be reasonable and manageable and not require a lot of extra time. Additionally, we already had a system in place that we utilize our echo system to really derive a list of patients who have moderate to severe AS and we knew we would be able to use that patient pool to be able to participate in this initiative. So the echo system we have is McKesson, and when we first started our TAVR program, we had sonographers receive super user training. That way they would know how to generate a monthly report based on certain echo parameters. So when joining this initiative, it was a matter of adjusting the reports to meet those parameters. And then when we were trying to decide what our sample size was going to be for the year, you first start by looking at how many patients you had in the prior year that met the moderate and severe AS criteria. For instance, I would look at 2022 and the total number of severe AS patients. I then looked at what 15% of those patients would be. And then if that number was less than 40, then 40 was our sample size for the year. Looking at moderate patients, I calculated what 5% of that would be, and if that number was less than 20, then you would use 20 as your sample size for the year. If your number is larger than the 40 or 20 number, then you would use that larger number. Now, whenever you're deciding how many patients to enter each quarter, you would divide that number by four, and that is your quarterly amount. For instance, if 40, severe AS patients are selected and 20 moderate AS patients, you would enter 10 severe AS and five moderate AS patients per quarter. When I got access to the tool, I started by entering data in quarter one, so we would have a full year of data to compare to for next year. But on average, I spend less than an hour or right at an hour per month entering data and looking at data in the registry tool. So far, looking at our data from earlier this year, we have a 93% timely treatment, which is great. And <clears throat> that means that our patients from class one indication for AVR to actually receiving AVR, that it's occurring within 90 days. Now, even though that number is great, we know there's always areas to improve upon. And looking at the patients that did not meet that timely criteria, there were a couple of trends. It was either patient's preference, that it was documented in the record that the patient wanted to wait for treatment because of a certain reason, or there were incidental findings that needed additional workup. But dental extractions and dental evaluation has also really been a problem for us. We've had patients who really need to have dental evaluations and we don't require all of our patients to undergo that at the beginning. But if it's identified that that is a problem for the patient, we do want it taken care of before we move forward with TAVR. So we were able to partner with a local dental office recently, so that way we can provide treatment for our patients in a more timely manner to get our patients evaluated and seen. 
Additionally, transportation, access, financial constraints are really a problem here as well. We've had a lot of patients who relied on services and they no longer are available because of COVID or the natural disasters that Dr. Bergen mentioned. So trying to find a way to get them to appointments and you know, really has been a struggle. So we were able to partner with our foundation to offer gas cards to patients, align them up with city transit, contact their insurance if they have a Medicare Advantage or Medicaid plan to see if they have transportation built in their policy or contact other services that can maybe assist for that patient to be able to have transportation. Regarding financial constraints, the Patient Advocacy Foundation has been wonderful in being able to provide financial grants to patients who need it. And they have a wonderful case management team as well. So I'll line the patient up with them to see if they have further services that can be provided. So I think really taking an individualized approach when really evaluating these patients, seeing what barriers they have and what resources we have to be able to help them is essential. Additionally, another helpful point of the tool is that you can add custom fields in. So if you want to track certain data, maybe who the interpreting echo physician is or where the echo is performed, you can add those tools in there to do internal tracking or maybe internal uh, quality improvement measures that your program selects. We were also able to add aortic valve calcium scoring to our TAVR CTA reports. And I do want to mention we do not use that as a sole indicator to determine treatment for patients, but it is a helpful tool to look at as we're evaluating. So we were able to get that added by going to the CT department to see what else needed to be included in order to have that in our reports. They already were obtaining the images, so it was a matter of getting it included in the template for the report for the radiologist. We are also in the process of going through a few upgrades in our system. Our ECHO system will be upgraded next year to include stroke volume index. So we are hoping that will help us to further identify other D3 patients. We are also in the process of converting to a new EMR system. So that upgraded system will have the social determinants form built in so we can identify barriers that patients may have sooner. So that way we can help get the resources they need. We also are working on an echo alert that will notify the ordering provider if a patient meets severe AS criteria based on their echo and recommending that a cardiology referral be sent if they're not currently established. So we're hoping with all of these different points and different things that we are implementing, we'll be able to further improve our timely treatment and maintain the current treatment that we have. So overall, it really is essential to have a lot of buy-in and support throughout your facility, including the TAPR physicians, especially the TAPR physicians, sonographers, heart team, and really make sure that there's transparency amongst everyone as well. We have found that utilizing our ECHO system is a great way to be able to capture and identify these moderate to severe AS patients and also help to see you know, that patients aren't falling through the cracks. Um, we have seen that this is manageable and does not require a lot of extra time, but you can really derive useful information from it. And we're hoping that we'll be able to identify further ways that we can improve our program and the care provided to our patients. So we're really thankful that the AHA allowed us to be a part of this webinar and hopefully it will help other sites as well. Thank you so much, Misty and Dr. Bergen. Um, I see, I don't see a question in the chat yet for you. Um, I'm working on answering a couple from before. Um, I have just a couple. So looking at your initial time to treatment numbers before joining, since you didn't join till this summer, um, you were already doing very well on the primary metrics. So what else have you gleaned from being able to look at, um, you know, why join if you're already doing well on that? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, but I think really looking further to see common trends that we have, you know, if the patients are not receiving timely treatment, what are those patterns and what can we implement to help further improve that timely treatment? So I think really grouping together to see that we had a certain number of patients that were waiting for dental evaluations or a certain number of patients waiting for transportation, um, being able to see, okay, what can we do to improve that and then further reach more patients. So yes, we are doing great, but I, there's always room for improvement. And I think that's one useful part of this initiative. 
Thank you. So you uh, mentioned institutional buy-in, um, and so you started with your, you know, lead physicians, and then a little bit of administration. Were there any other key people involved that you really feel like had um, an influence in joining on? I mean, you know, initially making sure the physicians were on board with it, and then I did talk to our sonographers as well, letting them know that we likely, you know, I would need their assistance. Um, throughout the process, and then upper administration was Im immensely supportive of this. So um, initially, I went to our chief nursing officer. That then it got extended to other members in administration, and everyone was very supportive. That's great. Um, lastly, which reports in the tool are becoming influential or beneficial in making a change at this early stage for you? Well, we are still early in it, so there's you know a certain amount of data that we can derive from it, but looking at the timely treatment has been really helpful in just seeing the trends um, of you know quarter one versus quarter two and just being able to see kind of ongoing how that is improving. Um, that has been helpful. So I'm hoping as we continue to participate, we'll be able to drive even more data from it and be able to run more reports, at least once we have a full year worth to be able to find other areas that we can improve upon. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you both for taking time out of your day today to um, share your experience as a newer site, and we're so glad to have you. Um, after today's webinar, all the attendees will receive a follow-up email with a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. In that email, you'll also receive a link to view the recording of the presentation. If you happen to jump on late or want to share with anybody, feel free to do that. On behalf of the American Heart Association and the Target Aortic Stenosis Initiative, thank you for joining us and have a great day. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.